So hi and welcome. You guys need me to use the microphone? Can you hear me? Sans mic? Wonderful. So this is uh, the Alumni Weekend Master of Arts Program in Humanities panel, the Colloquium Magazine panel. I'm Hilary Strang. Um, I'm really happy to see you guys here, many familiar faces, which is great. Uh, mostly what I'm going to do is let our panelists, all of whom are contributors to Colloquium Magazine, read to you and talk to you a little bit. And if we have time afterwards, I'll ask some questions and we'll have some discussion. Um, I wanted to quickly say a few words about Colloquium. This is a new project for the Master of Arts program. We've talked for years about wanting to have a forum for our students and our alums to present whatever kind of work they were doing. Uh, one of my favorite things about math is I think as the humanities, as graduate education in general becomes increasingly professionalized, math has remained a place that is a home for eccentric thinking, for people who do projects that don't fall into neat disciplinary categories, for people who don't necessarily find themselves at home in a particular department, but still are productive and thoughtful and interesting. And this is what we try to foster in math. This is what we think matters the most about our program. So when we started talking about having a journal, there were two things that seemed important to us. One, figuring out what kind of journal we could have that would actually allow for that kind of eccentricity and for these cross-disciplinary and non-disciplinary conversations to be fostered. Um, and also, how could we have something that looked really nice, that was beautiful, that looked appropriately cool for the cool work that our students do? Uh, which is a nerdy way to put it, but whatever, like that was important. Uh, we were really lucky last spring when uh, Marin Robinson, our associate director, is taking pictures, uh, AJ Ehrenstein, who's back there, and Bill Hutchison and I sat down to talk about this, that Bill happened to be very good at thinking through how we could do this. We decided that an online journal was the best way to go. It allowed for the mo widest range of possibilities, the cheapest <coughs> production costs, <laughs> given that we rely on the free labor of our alumni, um, and also the broadest possible audience. Um, and I think that both uh, issues of colloquium that we've had so far are beautiful, are provocative, bring together things in ways that are really fascinating. Um, and I'm so happy that we're doing this. Um, I, if the people who are colloquium editors could stand up, I'd just like to acknowledge you briefly. Um, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Greg, stand up. Thank you. Yeah. I really do want to say special thanks. I want to say special thanks to Bill, who has shouldered a lot of this, and uh, I think sufficiently browbeaten into forcing him to make this a sustaining and sustainable project that I think actually represents our program really, really beautifully. Um, I'm really proud of it. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves and talk to you, and I think we are starting with Ingrid. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Um, my name is Ingrid Haftel, kind of, maybe, better? All right. Uh, my name is Ingrid Haftel. I graduated math in 2010. Um, I'm currently an associate curator at the Chicago Architecture Foundation. Um, and I just want to set up a selection from the essay that I wrote for Colloquium. Um, by saying that uh, when I was preparing to give this little talk and, and do this reading, I reread my article and my first thought was, Jesus, do I sound preachy? Um, which I actually think that is a perfect reaction to what colloquium is doing and a really, in a good way, not in a bad way. Um, it's really providing a format for some risk taking and experimentation um, on the margins of what people might call official academic discourse and certainly on the margins of the type of work I do um, in my nonprofit work, um, where we typically don't have the opportunity to do that kind of thinking. Um, preachy for me is, I realize, part of the discomfort that really comes from trying to articulate a politics for myself, in my professional life, and in my personal life. And it's also um, a way to sustain a connection to the tradition we all aspire to as critical thinkers in the humanities. Um, I think that that discomfort also comes out of trying to stake a claim outside of disciplinary boundaries. Um, this essay, which I should point out, is based on a series of images, which you will not be seeing today, but you can see online. Um, capture some of my thinking, which is provisional, shifting, and of course, always subject to change. 
on how what I learned at MAF uh, continues to influence my own professional and personal politics and how that practice might be put to use to kind of take up non-traditional subjects like climate change. Um, this is a long way of saying thank you, Bill, Hillary, all the colloquium editors for the opportunity. Um, so now to the reading of it. I was about 11 when I imagined climate change for the first time. I was up either too late or too early, watching reruns of The Twilight Zone. The episode that left its indelible mark on me opens with a young woman alone in her apartment. First we see an unforgiving sun shining outside her window. Next, her long, lustful pause over a small glass of water. By the time Rod Sterling steps onto the screen, the situation has revealed itself. In this alternate universe, the Earth is moving closer to the sun. I'm not gonna try to do Rod Sterling right here, but you can imagine. <laughs> All of man's little devices to stir up the air are no longer luxuries, Sterling deadpans. They happen to be the pitiful and panicky keys to survival. The physical discomfort I imagined watching that episode left the strongest impression. It's the same anxious feeling I get walking to the L on particularly merciless summer mornings. Sterling's story might not have had the science right, but the value of his storytelling is ever more relevant. At the time of my viewing, the clarion call of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had been sounding for seven years, since 1988. 22 years later, weary from decades of governmental inaction and the outright impudence of corporations towards the idea of man-made climate change, activist Bill McKibben let his thermometer break. What I want to say is, this is fucked up. The time has come to get mad and then to get busy. It took me a long time to get bad and even longer to get busy. Getting busy has definitely been harder. As a curator and writer committed to the idea that critical interpretation and artistic inquiry shape the world around us, I have no doubt that the humanities will play numerous critical roles in determining the climate of the future. But I imagine I'm not alone when I struggle to envision what these roles should look like. Part of the difficulty stems from the gravitational pull of the politics and passions that continually tug us in so many directions. But another challenge, the challenge I'd like to explore here, is categorical. The crisis of climate change demands new modes of interpretation. To call human beings geological agents, writes Deepak Chakravarti, is to scale up our imagination of the human. How to exercise this imagination is a question that deserves our attention. I recently worked on an exhibition designed around the goal of getting people to understand and care about basic sustainability issues. In one section of the exhibition, we explored what the climate of a future Chicago might look like. There, we painted the summer of a future under a high carbon emission scenario. By the end of the century, a Chicago summer could feel like Mobile, Alabama, with a heat index of 105 degrees. We ask our visitors to imagine a future with frequent heavy rain and more heat waves. A sump pump stands on display as a metonym for increased flooding. This is an easy image to conjure for Chicagoans used to flooded basements. These are small attempts at making climate change real for people, and I'm not yet sure how successful they are. In many ways, the uncertain future we face confounds interpretation. In his essay, The Climate of History, Four Theses, Chuck Reverdy writes, it's not surprising that the crisis of climate change should produce anxieties precisely around futures that we cannot visualize. One of Chuck Reverdy's theses is that man-made climate change represents a breach between the modern separation of human and natural history. This breach demands new modes of inquiry and imagination. He writes, the ensuing crisis for humans is not understandable unless one works out the consequences of global warming. The consequences make sense only if we think of humans as a form of life and look at human history as a part of the history of life on this planet. For Chuck Reverdy, the situation requires nothing less than a new concept of history, one that stitches together the recorded history of human culture with the deep history of mankind as one species living on a very old and changing planet. Here, Chuck Reverdy gestures toward the cognitively dissonant space we must work through and create, interpret, and create out of today. By collapsing the human and the natural, we have the opportunity as creative and critical thinkers to imagine and communicate a human presence that at once transforms and is transformed by its environment. Photographer Richard Mizrak captured the situation beautifully when he observed a, quote, simple, if almost incomprehensible, equation. In it, the world is as terrible as it is beautiful, 
but when you look more closely, it is as beautiful as it is terrible. We must maintain constant vigilance to protect the world from ourselves and to embrace the world as it exists. It's time to get busy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Lawless, and uh, I graduated from MAF in 2004. I'm a poet. And briefly, speaking of the virtue of colloquium, I think it was Stephen Dobbins who said that, um, you know, what metaphor does and why it's valuable, valuable to us is that it gets different parts of the brain that ordinarily don't converse with one another to speak to each other. And it's clear just from clicking around different entries and articles and essays and poems and colloquium that it's doing something similar. And part of what I also enjoyed about the first two issues was that it, um, to a certain extent, you know, typified the kind of diversity that we see in this program, but it also helps show in clear relief um, the virtues of those different genres that appear there. It's easy to get bored with poetry or with essays on 19th century Gothic fiction if they're just embedded in immense tombs or publications that are dedicated to that genre alone. But somehow those things are enlivened when they're placed next to very dissimilar neighbors. Um, so I enjoyed them quite a bit. I felt honored to be included and also to return here as a panelist and to talk to some of the students. I'm going to talk about, um, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm done talking. I'm just gonna, <laughs> that's enough of that. Um, I'm just gonna read some poems um, uh, from a chapbook called Foreclosure. And uh, a lot of these poems are sort of grounded in, uh, in recording what stuff looks like in Northeast Pennsylvania, um, which is not a vacation destination of any sort, <laughs> which you'll pick up on from the poems themselves. <laughs> So I'll read, a, I'll read a few of these, and, um, and then I'll read a poem to close um, from the sort of larger project that subsumes foreclosure, which is the manuscript called I've Seen Thee Far Away, which is a line stolen from John Clare. Notebooks. Light built of ghost bricks. Clatter of magpie and Canada jay. A horse steps into a lake, stops, bows low for water. Knuckles of stars, dry pairings of a go. Singed birds like crust withering, bread just smoke you can eat. Pine trees comprised of idle daggers. These hours, barn dark and god hot, no good for going away. Water, wind, the breath between your teeth. Your tongue's back broken your blood tied in a knot. Sing, that is, until they tell you to stop. Foreclosure. Jar full of screws and washers. Moisture clouding the glass with remembered breath. Rusted swing set color of sunset. The swing set is blue. Hammers, nails, tires. Country car and the crabgrass by the shed crows in the tulip trees, floodwaters parting the gray planks of the wood bridge nearby, apple empires and toppled walls, hammock screws twisted into pines, pitch pouring into threading and grooves. You call me back to the car the way a man loses his hands between ladder rungs, you with your guardrail beauty sloping gently out of view with your dents and etchings. I watch the dust fluster the driveway. The snakes of weather stripping lash the soft tires. We back up a long way to the road. Knife, fire, map. Loon howl, some filings of moon still. What batters me awake? My wife takes a picture of daybreak. A lace shies into eyelets. The ankle creaks, a mistake. The facts of ligament and snap. We pack a backpack in the dark, knife, fire, map. Walking stick like a missing bone that God forgot. Blind strikes into ferns. Fear trees, forty fathers high. 
The wind makes a ship sound, a hurt keel, a creaking past sleep. Our heel strikes like hearts in the ground. Two more? Yeah. Factoryville Eclog. Factoryville is just a, a town um, in that part of Pennsylvania. November fields, ice withered parsley and wild alfalfa after a morning of freezing rain. I look for heart leaved asters in the open woods with rust dusted scissors in a plastic bag. They go in an old glass inkwell on my wife's nightstand and last eight days in water. Winter flower, she says, but that's not quite right. I don't correct her. Winter is her business, fall is mine. Christmas ferns wither well before December. I keep a bed of them in a bucket out back and watch ravens snatch the leaflets for their nests. Parabolic birds, the color of stories, maybe not. Everyone has a neighbor who shoots them. Not everyone has a neighbor, thank God. Thank God for what? Mm -hmm. For winter, the sound of ravens sorting ferns in the snow. My wife thinks I look too much. At what? You look too much, that's all. It's fall. A truck from Dalton Lumbers tipped over in the field. Everyone is alive. They left an hour ago and left their lumber. Stacks of blonde planks stained with ice 50 yards from dead asters. What do I tell her? They were out of flowers. Who are they, she'll say. The field, fall, who knows, they are out. I take some dead ones back, my scissors frozen shut. Thanks. Thank God for what? The field kill dressed in ice, a lumber spill, generations of ravens in the firs. No snow yet. Is that a blessing? I don't know. Who's in charge of these blessings? Sorry about the computer. I don't know. It's it's kind of inelegant. So, I'm <laughs> just gonna change a few things before. I... <laughs> I've seen thee far away. I've seen thee in the brush, a scrawl of buckthorn tenting thee, thy fangs sleeping, thy bread gnawed down to rind. I've seen thee dying like a man who must ask how to die. I've seen thee grow tree shadow in thy lapping at the creek. Thy car is nettled and thy wheel wells stir with pests. The world flower has eaten thee. The dirt speech of her petals, she spooks thee with her thorns. Come here. The moon sugars the scrap barrels. The cinder blocks rough the meadow. Come bring thy empty tin of turpentine. Lift the field cat from its crate. Trudge thy fingers through its mange and chew what flees away. Name it thy precious wreck, thy darkling, thine orphan, the black friendship of thy days.
I usually sit on the floor, so this is a little complicated for me. Um, so um, my name is uh, Rakir Rahman Jamil, and I'm uh, currently a math student, almost there <laughs> with these guys. And um, so I, I don't think I'll talk too much because I still have a final paper to write, <laughs> and uh, I don't want to end up rambling about my research topic. So uh, just a little thing about a uh, little bit about the piece. Um, so it's called Agahi. Uh, it, it's actually a Farsi word for um, meaning awareness. And it was something I composed uh, in 2012 for this uh, journalism award ceremony, um, the first ever um, uh, ever held in Pakistan. So it's, it's, it's an instrumental piece um, composed in a, an Indian scale called Rag Darbari. And um, it's, it's totally unexpected that it's part of the colloquium issue. I, I was, it's such an honor and uh, I really thank um, everybody here um, who's edited the, the write-up or who's included the piece in the, in the magazine and uh, I'm deeply grateful and uh, thankful to that. So um, without further ado, I'll begin playing a bit.
Hi everyone, I'm next. I don't know how I can follow that, but, I, but I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, my name is Joel Callahan. Um, I'm, uh, I graduated from math in 2005 and um, took a few years off, decided to come back to the university. Um, I'm a graduate student in comparative literature right now, and I just finished my first year as a preceptor. So um, I, just, I loved math so much I came back for more on the other side of things. Um, um, I was really excited to um, and considered an honor to be published in Colloquium. Uh, I have a translation in the new issue, and uh, because uh, math is really where I started translating seriously, and um, I remember quite distinctly wandering around the stacks in spring quarter, this would have been spring of 05, and finding an anthology of contemporary Italian poetry that I thought was sort of bizarre and interesting, and I wrote one of the poets, and he was very generous and looked at some of my translations and those were my first publications and it was later that year. And uh, it was, uh, so it means a lot to me to be able to sort of return to the scene of the crime. Um, let me just say a few, I'm gonna read a short selection. Um, the piece that I uh, published in Colloquium is the first three sections, about 2,000 or so words, from a, an, uh, a 1964 book called Hilaro Tragedia by the Italian neo-avant-garde fiction writer and journalist Giorgio Manganelli. Um, the book is a treatise on death. Um, he calls it a do-it-yourself guide. And um, it's written in this uh, a kind of hilarious Baroque uh, style with lots of uh, neologisms and um, archaic obsolete words. Um, the first section of the book is on the concept of descent. And uh, that's, I'm, I'm going to read sort of preamble uh, to that section. Um, I thought this piece was particularly apropos for colloquium because the Italian neo-avant-garde of the 1960s was really the first avant-garde to be, that consisted entirely of academics. Um, professors of uh, classics, philologists, uh, professors of modern literature, uh, translators, uh, playwrights, um, but mostly from within the academy. Um, in any case, um, so I just wanted to say, um, yeah, uh, so here I go. This is just the first couple of paragraphs, which is the preamble, emphasis on the amble uh, of Hilaro Tragedia by Giorgio Manganelli. If every discourse begins with a presupposition, an unprovable and unproving postulate sealed within it like an embryo inside a yolk and a yolk inside an egg, it would have to be in the discourse I have now set out upon the following prenatal axiom, humankind has a dissensive nature. I mean to say as a gloss, the human being is acted upon by a non-human force, by a desire or love or hidden intention secreted in the muscle and nerve, which he has not chosen or intended, which he ceases to desire and wish for, which presses itself upon him, adopts, invades, and rules him, and which might be said to have the name of the dissensive power or will. To descend, we must know first, is a simple task. To carry it out, one need not fear stumbling over encumbrances, preclusions, denials, gravitational repulsions, nor must one sulk along the road with cerebral, vibratile nostrils. The entire universe is shrewdly structured so as to make one movement of all possible movements, a movement so stimulating and open, captivating, or cheery rather, natural, naturally quick with every quickening quickness, whence it whistles through the air headed for a hypothetical target, either theological or infernal, celestially low, a target in which our weak, dissipate nature converges as an inverted fan of line centralized into a single point on a perspective graph. Note how this descent of vocation is manifest in our body. Fusiform toward the feet, how the body is suited to be an excavation device. Our heels the excavators with which we dig our own graves in friendly clay. Like an auger, we twist ourselves from the navel down, using that short, autonomous peg of an appendage between our legs. And also that truffle of a helix that essays the earth and earth that inhabits the devil's tartuffe and scratches open an abyss. From the spire, that gargoyle, i.e. your bony head, my friend, my co-owner of genitals, my accomplice in urine distillation, my brother in excrement, and you estimate to which I wearily acquiesce, skull model, my creaking and obtuse nothing, my co-abortion, conversational lithopedian, from the lowest height, lean out, abandon your precipice, be faithful to your descent, human. 
friend. Thank you. And next. Um, my name is Margaret Fink, and I'm a math alum from 2007. And um, I took kind of a year off to apply for graduate school and went to a PhD here at the University of Chicago in English. And I'm now beginning my dissertation on American literature. So, um, so in thinking about math and the humanities, how they kind of work together to prepare for this panel, I've been finding myself thinking a lot about a concept from writing pedagogy, which is um, thinking of the writing center as a transitional space between discourse communities. So if you're trying to bring students who don't really speak academic discourse into the academic discourse community, the writing center can serve as a transitional space. And I think that's actually a really helpful way to think about math. And I think it's really helpful to think about the discourse communities outside of the academic discourse community that math is bringing into relationship with academic discourse as multiple. And I think that um, for writing centers, usually you're trying to teach students how to speak academic discourse as the correct kind of discourse. But I think that with math, it sort of works both ways. Like the two different you know, sides of the equation can learn a lot from one another. But anyway, so when I was asked to write a book review essay for Chris Ware's graphic novel, Building Stories, I was really excited to be able to try to write in that kind of mathy transitional space. Um, and so what I kind of tried to do is write in a way that matched what goes on in my brain, you know, the kind of, I have it written in here, I pew, 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 you know, like laser <laughs> down, like pew, pew, pew of like pleasurable thoughts that happen for me at least when I'm sort of in a state of reverie, like I'm in the shower, or I'm on the train, something like that. And putting that together, melding that with something that's closer to an academic argument, and is using drawing from sources that I've been reading in the course of my research. Um, so, okay, in writing about Ware's graphic novel, I'm ultimately arguing something. I'm arguing that while a lot of the reviews that surrounded its release um, point to the way in which the form is really radical and experimental. Um, the subject matter and the content have a lot to offer as far as expanding how we think about representative content itself. Um, and sort of writing-wise, I kind of have like bathetic footnotes that sort of poke fun at footnotes and I um, have two really huge digressions. One where I'm situating myself as a writer um, and one where I talk about Honey Boo Boo and Lauren Berlant. <laughs> um, and so, anyway, so as I'm reading some selection for, for you today, I'm going to be reading the opening digression and then just sort of some pieces that track my argument more or less. Okay. So, as I write, I'm sitting in Advocate Health Center in Chicago's Lakeview neighborhood struck by the weary and aesthetic of my circumstances. Alone in a now closed courtyard cafe, I'm surrounded by vibrant ochres, deep denim blues, and rusty oranges. Echoing the primary color of the building story's cover, it's an oddly cheerful, faux Tuscan theme, scheme, in which to pursue my solitary work. I picture a bird's eye view of the repeated square table, me with my Mac in the lower left, where's graphic novel next to me, one of the booklets fallen to the floor. I'm living in an image that resonates with Ware's characteristic tension between scenes of perfunctory conversation, boredom, and reminiscence, and the beauty of the smooth lines, draftsman-like precision, and blocks of unmodulated color, both muted and vivid, that he renders them in. And this is an in-between time consonant with the small moments of the mundane he takes pain to portray. I'm waiting for my friend Corinne to come with a caffeine-free Diet Coke so we can take it to our friend James, who had a stroke almost a month ago. And then I have a footnote, which is, it says, I was summoned to the ICU to read his sign, read his sign language fingerspelling. It was, all, it was the way he could communicate. He lost speech functioning. Um, it was a litany of hi, WTF, headache, hi, head, head, hi, headache. <laughs> 
Pantheon's recent release of Chris Ware's building stories has prompted a flurry of reviews, like a flock of tiny birds taking off. As an object, it's an unwieldy genre building thing, er, not building, genre bending thing. As one reviewer charmingly announces, Chris Ware had published a box. <laughs> building stories come housed in a large cardboard box indeed, and as the Library of Congress ca classification states on the inside cover, it's comprised of, quote, 14 easily misplaced elements, end quote. <laughs> That building story form is experimental is easily recognizable to his readers. It's a book in part with no clear beginning and no in clear end, much of which is recounted in ways that betray how the scenes are filtered through the protagonist's narrative memory. I'd like to briefly suggest, though, that his subject matter, the everyday life of a young, disabled lady Chicagoan and the other everyday lives in her orbit, is experimental, radical in ways that seem to be going under-recognized in the generalized excitement about the novel's peculiar, constellated form. Ware's work is technically beautiful, to be sure, but to my mind, his creative, slow, immersive rendering of ordinariness is what is radical and exciting. I've argued elsewhere that Ware's narrative of noticing, the slow pacing of much of his karmic storytelling, and the iconicization of extremely particular details, crumbs on the floor by the toilet seat, creates a certain aesthetic of ordinariness in which the extraordinary body can be enfolded or encountered in counterintuitive ways that still feel like realism. In a more generalized sense, I think that we are managed to deliver on the transformative potential of fixing on the ordinary that other genres fail to realize, and I'm thinking of reality TV. Okay and holding us close to these mundane pileups of history and routine, where comics give us practice in tolerating the affective weightiness of the everyday. I'll just stop there. Thank you. So I, I guess I'm supposed to speak into the mic, um, which makes it weirder that I want to ask you guys questions now. Um, so first of all, that was really wonderful. And thanks to all of you guys. Um, and it's. It's hard to think of what the right kind of thing to ask now could possibly be. Uh, but I, I was just thinking, and this was sort of initially prompted um, by uh, both Ingrid and Margaret's work here, um, but also by the kind of um, back and forth between the very inviting in what you guys are doing and the very esoteric in what you're doing. Um, and I, I was thinking about the way in which when we're uh, working with our math students on thesis writing, one of the things we say all the time is you need to think about your reader, right? And what that sounds like it's asking students to do is to distance themselves from their work so that they can reflect on it. But really what we're asking them to do is to think about the particular incredibly tiny subset of people who might possibly be interested in this work and how do you convince them of it, right? So in, in, that, in that sort of like, we teach students to write by asking them to think about audience, but really what we're doing there is a very disciplinary thing, right? Getting people to think very narrowly about an audience. So I think the thing that I'm interested in here is when you guys are writing, when you're composing, how do you think about audience? How do you think about the relationship between a desire to sort of communicate broadly or even to be communicative versus the desire to, uh, I don't know, become precise or rigorous, as we say at the <laughs> University of Chicago. Or, you know, so I'm thinking about the kind of, again, the sort of push between uh, the esoteric, right, the beautiful, the hard to understand, and openness, right, the kinds of things that we are, you guys are all sort of gesturing to that colloquium maybe is a thing can, that you can, that, that is maybe a thing that colloquium can do. Do you have thoughts, audience? I mean, for me that's interesting because that, that's precisely why colloquium was so inviting. Um, so in my work um, as a curator and really a, an exhibition developer, um, I am constantly uh, told by uh, my betters to you know, write for a broad audience to write for as many possible people as you can possibly write for and get them to come back and get them to spend time in this exhibition. Um, and and that is a, that's a fantastic goal. Um, 
there are lots of times when I'm doing that work where I want to delve deeper. Um, and, and one thing, um, I guess a red flag for me is, um, not a red flag, but uh, the reason I, I appreciate this format is you can kind of experiment with that. Um, I, what I'd like to do is push myself to do that in my day-to-day -day work um, because I think that we can get into a mode of thinking that this thinking belongs only in math or in colloquium. Um, and I think that can be a condescending way of, of thinking about these basic concepts um, that, that we should be sharing broadly. How to do that is, is a really hard. It, it requires <laughs> modulation. It really does. Yeah. That answered your question. Yeah, so um, when you introduced us, you said something about um, eccentric thinkers and how math you know, sort of a bunch of eccentric thinkers. And if I was trying to, as I was writing this piece, I think the audience that I was kind of thinking about was very um, accommodating, actually. It was great. Um, I could kind of write anything I wanted. Like, because, I, I mean, I really do think that math can tolerate some of these silly, sad stories that my piece sort of provides, I hope, right? Like, you, this is the thought, but I do think that mathers have a, one of the values of our community, if I can be so bold as to set them down, is um, a wide interest in a wide variety of things and in a, a willingness to sort of um, go along for the ride with each other's particular interest and I mean this was a very pleasure based essay for me um, and I liked the fact that writing for this particular audience I could get into some pretty complex thoughts because another I think core value of the math community is um, a willingness to be challenged intellectually you know a desire to do the work instead of just shutting down to try to connect with whatever it is that you're presented with um, intellectually. Um, so I guess um, for when you go, when, sorry. Yeah. Okay. You got it. Yeah. I could have just given you mine. Yes. <laughs> um, when you're sort of composing uh, music, I guess for me, um, the, the audience is always a secondary. Uh, that's always secondary because the first thing uh, that you have to uh, take care of is establish what you want to say through your music. I mean, because if I, if, I, if I don't do that, then you sort of, if you tailor it towards a certain audience, so for example, this one was tailored towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, journalists, right? So if I were to think in that narrow uh, frame of mind, then I don't think I'd would have been able to communicate this piece to you uh, if I composed it in that way. So I guess you have to sort of um, not narrow, narrow it down to a specific audience. Um, and that's what, uh, because I come from that uh, background of classical music where it's all about a specific, you're playing for a specific certain audience and it's a very sort of elite form of music, but that's totally, uh, I disagree with that approach and uh, that is why um, uh, when, especially when it comes to, co to composition, you have to focus on uh, the message, uh, which is always uh, something that should that everyone should be able to relate to. Whether um, you know you're a journalist, whether you're in the humanities, whether you're a musician, or um, anyone you know, anyone on the street, even. So I think that's the the right approach when it comes to uh, that's my approach when it comes to composing music. Yeah. 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 Poets? <laughs> I'll respond. <laughs> um, so my perspective is a little different because um, I'm performing someone else's work and um, translation has been called a kind of performance, right? I'm, I'm not composing in the sense that, you know, a poet or a, a music composer composes, mm -hmm. right? And, but, and so, in essence, what I'm doing is I'm trying to communicate something, some, something not just about, you know, the kind of semantic content, right, of the original, but also my experience uh, reading it. And, and as I was sort of, even as I'm reading it now, um, in front of all of you, I was sort of reflecting, and um, there was a little bit in my brain where I was remembering some of the original, um, some, of, some of the kind of texture of the original language, 
and um, sort of re realizing that when I'm performing it even now, um, there's really no one in this room who's um, you know, getting it, right? Um, you know, for which I sort of apologize, but I also, you know, <laughs> have to kind of just throw up my hands and say, you know, <laughs> that's the, them's the breaks, right? Um, but uh, the thing to say, uh, about this particular piece uh, too, and what interests me about translating work that's uh, esoteric and difficult, and that moves in and out of different registers, high and low. Um, there's a lot of sort of low comedy. There's a lot of uh, you know poop jokes in this uh, treatise, but there's also a lot of incredibly arcane um, references uh, to you know medieval scholarship on. Uh, you know, heaven and hell uh, that Manganelli, you know, was quite familiar with, um, which would have been all but lost to even his readers in Italian. So, um, is it, it pushes those aspects of these texts, be, uh, reading it through another language pushes them, you know, into relief, even sharper relief, right? So, um, there's something pleasurable about the, <laughs> I, to me, the, the experience of trying to replicate a sensation I have when I'm reading something, even if it's mediated through another language, right, and trying to communicate something about that, and constantly, you know, trying to be aware of exactly the kind of thing Hillary is talking about, the kind of way that I'm both bridging two language communities, or trying to, but also trying to write something that sounds coherent um, in a text that tries to bridge different kinds of jargon and language communities. Um, so, in any case, that's what I'd say about that. Um, I mean, it seems like the rest of you have talked a lot about sort of bringing two different spaces together and whatever, and I um, am much more aggressive and indifferent. <laughs> <laughs> to whomever happens to be before the poem <laughs> that some other version of me wrote some time ago. I mean, you said you're performing someone else's work, so am I. Yeah. It just happens yeah. that I wrote it. It happens to be the case. <laughs> you know. um, but I don't think of poems as something that I read so much as that I wield. And every poem is a record of a certain kind of failure, whatever affection I might have for it or however successful I might think it is. And so there's just no way to fully inhabit that without, um, you know, just being torn or dented a little bit by ambivalence. And that's why what I call critical ambivalence is a sort of my, my muse, it's my guiding idea. Um, and it's, it's, it's just what it sounds like. And I mean, with the book of, uh, you know, pastorals or, you know, kind of eco-poetical uh, poetry, you know, these are things that like sicken me. And um, and these are kind of tools in contemporary poetry that really bother me. And, and um, um, but I'm just in, inhabiting them in this this difficult way. That I don't know if it's really meant to go outward, but it, it, this is a certain kind of key ambivalent demonstration that I make of it. So my notion of, of audience is not entirely cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I mean, I, I do think sometimes that the sort of uh, the secret message of the math core class, Foundations of Interpretive Theory, which perhaps many of you remember, is um, something like just trying to get people to consider the possibility that there might be two things that are true at once and you can't really decide between them through a process that you call logic. Um, <laughs> or also um, that maybe the secret slogan of math is fail again, fail better, right? Because that's uh, pretty much what we spend our time doing. So I think we're almost out of time. Um, do you guys have final things that you want to say? I mean, Greg, I like ending on your note because it was a skeptical, bitter. Um. <laughs> AJ says we should drink beer now. All right, thank you guys very much. That was really, really wonderful.